welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We are very, very excited. It's great to see you in person. Some of you, I think, we're seeing each other for the first time in person, which is incredible. Um, our students have worked incredibly hard to make all of this possible for you today, from biographies, speeches, timelines, and research. It's been a lot of work. So they can't wait to share it all with you. I have just a couple reminders for you. First of all, please show your excitement for all of their hard work and applaud every time they finish. They're excited to take a bow. Um, after, we have already taken a picture, and some of you, if you check your phones, you'll see on Seesaw, I already posted a picture of your child in front of their poster. So don't worry about doing that when they finish. They're going to come down um, from the balcony, grab their book bags, they're going to grab their posters, and they get to take us home with you today. And then they will meet you um, right outside. I think that's all I have. So I'm going to let them get started. Thank you once again for joining us, and we'll see you after the performance. Are you a famous surgeon? Have you started up a new hospital? Were you the first to do a successful heart surgery? Well, I was. Hi, I'm Daniel Williams. I was born in 1856, Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania. In 1867, my dad became ill and sadly died weeks later. My mom couldn't raise seven children by herself, so she sent two of my sisters to live with other relatives. As a teen, I moved to Wisconsin to be closer to my sisters and to attend high school. I decided to open up my own barber shop. While I loved being a barber, I wanted to accomplish more. I remember being Dr. Henry Palmer at the barber shop, and I, I decided to make a meeting with him about the possibility of becoming a doctor. Eventually, I asked to be his assistant. Dr. Palmer was a great teacher. He taught me how to stitch wounds, set broken bones, and deliver babies. After two years, he suggested I continue my education at Chicago Medical College. In 1880, I traveled to Chicago, Illinois. I found a place to live, passed my medical school entrance exam, and started my studies. Three years went by, and I finally finished medical school. My old Chicago hospital would accept me. I decided to open my own practice. I continued to improve my skill skills in ways to lower the risk of infection. I became known in Chicago as a great surgeon. Despite reputations, I couldn't get any African Americans accepted into Chicago hospitals. So that's why I made up my mind. I, start up, I decided to start up a new hospital. I call it Provident Hospital. It opened in 1891. The hospital did well in its first year. 167 of 189 people improved and recovered completely. Only 22 people died. Then in 1893, after Provident Hospital opened, a man named James Cornish was brought to the hospital. He had been, he had been stabbed in the chest. It turned out that his pericardium was damaged, and I, and I was able to repair it and stitch up his chest. I saved James' life. Newspapers across the country shared news of my surgery. And before I knew it, I was really famous. In 1893, again, I was invited to Washington, D.C. to make improvements for Freeman's Hospital. <laughs> Thanks to me, now the hospital is a place where people expected to be cured. I fell in love with Alice Johnson, and after dating for six months, we finally got married. We moved to Chicago, and I returned to Provident Hospital. Even though I got great improvements to Freeman's Hospital, people didn't appreciate me. They made up fake rumors and, and said I was misusing the hospital's money and other cruel things. When I returned to Provident, some doctors wanted to run things their own way. They gave me a hard time and worked against me. One day, I couldn't take any more, and I left Provident Hospital. After that, I was busy. I was, inv I was invited to work at hospitals all around the country as surgeon and teacher. In 1920, my wife and I built a retirement home in the woods in northern Michigan. I died in 1931 at my home in Iowa, Michigan, but the 13-bed hospital I founded is now a medical center, and it led other African Americans to medicine, and my career continues to inspire people long after my death. Have you ever taken part seven alarm clocks just to see how they work? Were you in World War II? Have you been in the Navy? I have done all these things and more that have helped make me famous. 
I'm Grace Harper. I was born December 9th, 1996 in New York City, New York. When I was seven years old, I took a first time and learned cars just to see how to work. My parents encouraged on my education. So I went to Vassar to college and earned degrees. In 1934, I married Vincent Harper. Then in 1934, I became the first woman to earn a doctor's degree in math from Yale University. That same year, I began teaching at Vassar College. When I was 35 years old, the U.S. entered World War II. I wanted to help, so I joined the Navy. But the Navy said I couldn't because it was too old and didn't weigh enough. I didn't give up. I got permission from the government, then I was able to join. One of my jobs in the Navy was to work in Mark 1 computers. I was sent to Harvard to join a team of programmers. The computers were used, the computers were used to aim novel guns in different weather. It could do long calculations automatically. My team used Mark I to solve problems that help in the war. I wrote the first computer, mo- computer manual for Mark I as I got to program it. In 1934, in 1935, a moth I got on my computer and it stopped working. I used tweezers to get it out. I started using the term debug to mean fixing computer problem. People still use my term today. In 1946, I had to, I was four years old. The age I'm in the Navy was 38 years old. The U.S. asked me to retire, but I still serve in the Naval Reserves. I decided to stay in Harvard as a Navy researcher. One day, I thought computers should be, do more than just math problems. I also thought computer programs should be written in English. In 1950, 1953, I invented a computer call, program called a Complainer. It translated the English language into the language that a computer can understand. This program is talked by using special number codes. The codes are only used by ones and zeros. In 1966, I had to stop working for the Naval Reserves because of my age. People over 62 years old cannot be members of the U.S. Navy. However, the Navy can get computers to work without me. So less than a year after I retired, the Navy asked me back. Finally, I retired from the Navy in 1986. I was 79 years old. I continue to give speeches all over the world. I received many many awards for honors on my work. In 1991, I was the first one to be awarded the National Medal Technology. And I was also awarded the Society of Women Engineers and the highest honor in the first ever computer science man of the year award. I even had a Navy ship called the USS Harper. In December, of 1991, I started to get sick. But sadly, I died on January 1st, 1992. People who knew me call me Amazing Grace. Today, I'm known for, for being a pioneer for me possible for anyone to learn how to code. Have you ever been in a band with Chick Webb or won 13 Grammys? What about performing at Carnegie Hall 26 times? These are just some things that I did and I'm known for. Hi, I'm Ella Fitzgerald, also known as the First Lady of Jazz. I was born on April 25th, 1917 in Newport News, Virginia. One of my biggest passions as a kid and as an adult was singing and dancing. I would sing in church and when I was at home, I enjoyed singing along with the radio. I danced so much that sometimes I would put on dancing shows with my friends. I thought my feet would make me famous, not my voice. In 1932, I moved to Harlem, New York. On November 21st, 1934, I entered a town concert at the Apollo Theater. I won first prize that night. Then, in March of 1935, I got my big break. A man named Chick Webb was looking for a lead singer for his band. Chick's saxophone player, Benny Carter, heard that I had won first prize at the Apollo Theater. Benny and I met, and he introduced me to Chick Webb. Chick asked me to sing with the band at their next job. I sang with the band for two weeks. Chick liked what he had heard, so he asked me to sign a contract, and I began singing with the band regularly. Soon I began making records. My first recording was on June 12, 1938, with Chick Webb. It was called Love and Kisses. I also recorded a tis- Get a task it. it was my first hit. The Chick Webb Orchestra often played at the Savoy Ballroom in Harlem, New York. The Savoy is famous for band battles. The Chick Webb Orchestra battled the Benny Goodman Orchestra on May 11, 1937. At least 4,000 people filled the Savoy that night. I sang my best and the crowd loved me. We stole the show. Meanwhile, Chick's health was poor. He had been born with a disease called spinal turbulosis. The horrible pain he had felt throughout his life had just gotten worse. On June 16, 19...
38, Chick died. I honored Chick by singing at his funeral. I was very upset about his death because he was like a father to me. After Chick's death, I took over his band. But by 1942, me and the band members decided to go our separate ways. Soon I became interested in a new kind of music called bebop. I also started recording scat songs. In November 1946, I went on tour with Dizzy Gillespie. As I became older, I continued performing and recording. By 1991, I had recorded at least 200 albums. In my final years, my health was poor and my eyesight was failing. In 1986, I had heart surgery. Then the doctors discovered I had diabetes. In 1993, they had to remove both of my legs because of poor blood flow. On June 15th, 1990, I died at my home in Beverly Hills, California. I was 79 years old. For more than 60 years, I sang all kinds of music. But most of all, I sang jazz. Many people fall in love with jazz music. And just so you know, I'm the reason why. In 1987, NASA chose 15 out of 2,000 people to train as astronauts. I was one of them. One of the NASA workers said I was intelligent, sincere, and a stable young woman. Hello, my name is Mae Jemison. I was born in 1956 in Dexter, Alabama. I had two siblings named Ricky and Anna Sue, and my parents' names were Dorothy and Charlie Jemison. When I was three, my family moved to Chicago. I went to Midcosh Elementary School. My kindergarten teacher asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? Kids called out firemen. I called out scientists. I was fantasized by the stars, by the planets, and the universe. In 1964, I entered Morgan Park High School. I developed strong math skills and interest other than in science. In 1966, no. In, in 1973, I graduated from high school when I was only 16 years old. A law school offered me scholarships. I chose Stanford University in California. I took classes in chemical engineering and African-American studies. I graduated in 1977 and decided to become a doctor. I went to Cornell University in New York City. I studied biomedical engineering to better understand the human body. After four years of, at Cornell, I became a doctor. I worked at Los Angeles County Hospital in California. In 1983, I joined the Peace Corps. I finished my work in West Africa in 1985 and returned to Los Angeles to work as a doctor. I took engineering class because I always felt like there's more to learn. In 1987, NASA chose me to train as an astronaut. I was assigned to a crew on the Space Shuttle Endeavor. I spent eight days in space trying out experiments and answering questions about the lack of gravity in space. In 1994, I began a science camp for kids called the Earth We Share. Students from all over the world come to camp. They ask questions about the problems we face on Earth. In 1994, I also started the Jemison Group to help improve the lives of people living in West Africa. My life imagines and hope continues to hold secrets, new challenges, and good times. I am always looking forward to the future and the opportunities ahead. It is not easy to be a pioneer, but oh, it is fascinating. I would not trade one moment, even the worst moment for all the riches in the world. I became the first woman doctor, and it was hard, but it was worth it. I am Elizabeth Blackwell. I was born on February 3rd, 1821 in Bristol, England. My dad had a sugar refinery. When I was 11, a fire destroyed it. My family set sail on a seven-week trip to the United States to start a new life there. First, we settled in New York. My dad's business relied on sugarcane harvested by slaves. My dad was against slavery, so he moved to Ohio, where slavery was abolished. Then my dad died, leaving us almost penniless. To help support the family, two of my sisters and I set up a school for girls. We earned enough money to keep our family together. Unfortunately, we closed our school in 1842, but I still taught privately. I then took a job as a teacher in Kentucky. While I was teaching, conversation with a dying friend changed my life. She told me she wished she had a woman doctor. 
At that time, there were no female doctors. I decided becoming a doctor would be a good way to help people. I took more teaching jobs and earned tuition money to pay for medical school. Unfortunately, no medical school would let me in because I was a girl. Finally, in October 1847, I was accepted at Geneva Medical College in New York. After graduation, I decided to train to be a surgeon, but I knew I would need more training and experience. I went to Europe and found, a, found work at a maternity hospital in Paris. One day, while I was treating a baby with an eye infection, I got pus in my eye. My eye became infected and I went blind in that eye. My surgeon dreams were over. In 1851, I went back to the United States and settled in New York. No one wanted to hire me because I was a woman, so I started my own medical practice and gave public lectures. I wanted everyone to believe that good hygiene could help people stay healthy. In 1853, I opened a clinic in a poor town of New York. Four years later, my sister, another woman doctor, and I turned the clinic into a hospital. And then in 1868, I achieved a lifelong dream when I set up a medical college. The next year, I moved back to England and opened up a successful medical practice. In 1875, I became a professor at London School of Medicine for Women. Sadly, I died in 1910. Throughout my career, I wrote and gave lectures and did my part to improve health. Have you ever scored 108 goals or made the U.S. national soccer team at 15? Are you an international soccer star? Those are just some of the amazing things I have done. I am Mia Hamm. I was born March 17, 1972 in Selma, Alabama. I was one of four children. Even though I was born in Selma, I did not stay there for long. I lived in California, Texas, Virginia, and even Italy. My dad was in the Air Force, and my family moved around a lot. My love of soccer started when I moved to Italy. When I lived in Texas, I played baseball, basketball, tennis, and soccer. I even played football on the boys' middle school team. In 1987, I was given the chance to play in the Olympic Development Tournament, and I scored five goals. This was more than any other player in the tournament. When I was 15, I made the U.S. national soccer team and became the youngest player in history to be on the team. In 1989, I became a student at the University of North Carolina, UNC. While there, I helped the women's soccer team win four NCAA championships. After I graduated, UNC retired my number 19 jersey. In 1991, I helped the United States win its first ever Women's World Cup. I even played in the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, Georgia. Our team won the gold medal. Three years later, I scored my 108th international goal. This made me the top scorer among both men and women throughout the world. But it was the 1999 Women's World Cup that brought me the most attention. In the end, we beat China and I became even more popular. I retired in 2004 with 158 international goals and two Olympic gold medals. I then created the Mia Hamm Foundation, a charity that helps find a cure for bone marrow diseases. My older brother, Garrett, died of a rare blood disorder in 1997. In 2003, I married a professional baseball player named Nomar Garcia Para. We have two twin daughters, Ava and Grace. My husband and I will not push our daughters to play sports. We will tell them to be their own people. But if they want to play soccer, I would be more than happy to teach them. Many people thought I was the fastest woman in the world. Years after my death, people still remember me the same. I am Ilma Rudolph. I was born on June 23rd, 1940 in Clarksville, Tennessee. I had 21 brothers and sisters. When I was five, I got polio. My left leg and foot became crooked. Every day, my father would go to work, my brothers and sisters would go to school, and my mother would stay home with me. I always dreamed of going to school. 
When I was nine, to everyone's shock, I took off my brace and I walked. At age 11, the brace was gone for good. I started to play basketball at school with my friends. When I went to high school, I set the state record for scoring the most points in one basketball game. I was faster than anyone else. When I was 16, I went to the Olympics in Melbourne, Australia. My team won a bronze medal for the 4x1 relay in 1956. I went to Tennessee State University on a full athletic scholarship. I was the first member of my family to go to college. There, I started to become a teacher. My coach made me work hard too. In 1960, I went to the Olympics again. The day before my race, I hurt my ankle, but I did not give up. I still raced. I won. I set the world record for fastest woman. Then, for my third race, I was the last runner on my relay team. I almost dropped the baton. At the end of the race, I barely made it. We all had to look at a picture to see who won. Then the judges announced the winner. We won! I won three gold medals. In 1963, I graduated from college and became a teacher. I later married and had four children. Sadly, I became sick with brain cancer. On November 12, 1994, in Nashville, Tennessee, I died at age 54. In the beginning, my feet were always up to, to the challenge, but a determination was all I needed. When I talk to a little flower, the little peanut, they will give up the secrets. People say that I'm crazy, but I know I'm not. I'm just unique. I'm George Washington Carver. I was born in 1864, but no one knows for sure. I was a slave in Diamond Grove, Missouri. I was one of two kids. My mom was a slave. Her owner was a mother since Susan Carver. When I was born, I was given the same last name as our owners. One night, my mom and dad were kidnapped. Mother saw me, but he didn't find me. The Carvers had no children, so they raised James and me as their own. I was a happy child who loved plants and animals. Aunt Susan taught me how to read and write. I wanted to learn everything. The only school for Black students were miles away, so I had to wait. At age 12, I left my home to go to school. I lived with a family who found me sleeping in the barn. Soon, I was old enough to live on my own. For a while, I moved from place to place. Then I came to a small town in Kansas. A man had the same name as me, so I added a W to my name. It's for Washington, is what I told my friends. I liked it when people said George Washington Carver. I wanted to go to college, but not many Black men went to college in the 1890s. However, I was sure that I would go. I worked hard and saved my money. At last, I went, at last, I went to college in, in Iowa. There, I studied plants and farming. Then I went to Iowa State College in Ames to study. I was the first Black student to get into Iowa State. I graduated in 1896, yet there's still more I wanted to learn. After college, Booker T. Washington asked me to teach science in Tuskegee also too, in Alabama. There I did important work with plants. I found many ways to use, I found many new ways to use sweet potatoes and soybeans. I invented hundreds of new things such as pink, Plant, paints, plastics, and dyes. I also wanted to help farmers. I, I built a classroom on wheel, wheels and drove the wagon to nearby farms to teach about agriculture. I also thought about planting peanuts and how they could help farmers too. I found many ways to use peanuts. They could be turned into glue, medicine, gasoline, and even paper. I had no wife or children, but I was not alone. Tuskegee was home, and my students were family. Sadly, I died on, on January 5th, 1943. In 1946, the U.S. named January 5th to address the Tin Carver Day. I had given the world 300 ways to use peanuts and 180 ways to use sweet potatoes. My hard work helped many people, and my ideas helped performers have better lives. My unusual flavors of ice cream are famous around the world. Now I work to encourage citizens to speak up about political issues. It was just some of the amazing things that I have done. I am Ben Cohen. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, March 19, 1951. I was actually born in the same place as Jay, my co-friend and best friend. My, my family moved to the town of Merrick, and me and my dad loved ice cream. In 1963, I entered Merrick Avenue Junior High School. Me and Jay were in the same gym class together. It wasn't until gym teachers being unfair that our friendship grew.
1966, both Jerry and I and Cameron High School, we spent a lot of time together. Eventually, we graduated in 1969. I was not interested in college, but my parents wanted me to go. I did not want to disappoint them, so I chose to attend Colgate University. I did not like Colgate any better than high school, so I left. In 1974, I got a job to teach crafts at Highland Community School in Pardax. It is a school for troubled teenagers. There I taught them many things like pottery, photography, and silk screening. Finally, I had a job I enjoyed. In 1977, the school that I went that closed, it was then that Jerry and I decided to open an ice cream parlor. We knew we, 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 knew we, we had a lot to learn about ice cream. We knew, since we went to college, we knew that college students loved to eat ice cream. We searched for college and we settled in Burlington, Vermont. The University of Vermont was located there. The first thing we did was borrow $4,000 from the bank. Ben and Dre's Homemade Inc. was incorporated December, 19, December 17, 1977. Not too long after, we found a place to start our ice cream shop. It was an old gas station. Our ice cream was great. We used the best ingredients we could find. Unfortunately, premium ingredients were very expensive. We barely had enough money to feed ourselves. The first Ben and Jerry's homemade scoop shop was open May 5th, 1978. The shop was crowded with people. So many people loved our ice cream. We went out in just a few days. At first, we worked about 100 hours a week. Jerry and I wanted our shop to be fun, so we organized some games and contests and even showed a free movie on the wall next door. We soon took out another loan from our company. We were able to borrow $30,000. With the money, we opened a factory but we can make enough ice cream to meet demand. We even bought, bought a deri- delivery truck. Jerry and I offered our ice cream our ice cream to grocery stores in 1981. We opened another factory. Soon, people all over the country wanted our ice cream. In June 1981, the first Ben & Jerry's franchise opened in Vermont. We liked running a business in a way that treated our employees well. Our employees were fairly compensated. They even shared 5% of the company's profits. Jerry and I also wanted to give back to the community. In 1985, Jerry and I started the Ben and Dre's Foundation. This organization supports community groups throughout the United States. In 1988, Jerry and I committed our business in a mission statement. It states that we will make the best ice cream possible, and it promises the company will continue helping the community. After many years of success with our company, Jerry and I sold our business to a large food company called Unilever in 2000. Although we are no longer in business, we continue, we continue giving our time and money to communities. We didn't always follow typical rules, but we did things our own way and made many people happy. I have for many different awards. I set a speed record for flying across the United States in only three hours. I was chosen as one of the first U.S. astronauts. Those are just a few of the things I'm famous for. I'm John Glenn. I was born in Cambridge, Ohio on July 18, 1921. I was an only child. My dad was a plumber and my parents ran a plumbing supply store. From an early age, I love cars, trucks, and trains. When I was eight, my dad surprised me and gave me my first ride in a plane. After that first biplane flight, I was hooked. I worked hard in school and found jobs to make money. After high school, I entered Muskingum College and thought about a career in chemistry or medicine. Unfortunately, World War II changed that. I never stopped thinking about that first flight of my dad. So when the government began a civilian pilot training program, I jumped at the chance. I went to flight training school as a test pilot. By the time the U.S. joined the war, I had become a top-notch pilot. I joined the military in 1942 and became a U.S. Marine fighter pilot by 1943. I joined the Navy and married my childhood sweetheart, sweetheart Annie Castor. I was then sent to the South Pacific to fly for the U.S. Marine Corps. During World War II, I learned to fly many different kinds of airplanes. When I returned home, both my father and Annie's offered me a job. I decided to stay in the military. Before long, the U.S. was at war again, this time with Korea. I shot down three enemy enemy planes, and during the Korean War, I flew 90 missions. During those two wars, I earned four distinguished service crosses and 18, 18 air medals. After the Korean War, I became a test pilot. My job was to fly new military planes and see how they worked. On July 16, 1957, I flew a plane from California to New York and set a new speed record. In 1958, I applied to join NASA's new space program. Project Mercury was a plan to send the first U.S. astronauts to space. 
On April 9, 1959, NASA chose me and six other pilots. We became the first U.S. astronauts. On February 20, 1962, I finally made my first space flight. I flew, I flew 100 miles above Earth in the Friendship 7 spacecraft. I orbited Earth three times. Then my space shuttle splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. I became an American hero. I left NASA two years after my Mercury flight. In 1965, I helped run the Royal Crown Cola Company. I also became interested in politics. In 1974, I won a U.S. Senate seat for Ohio. I served in the U.S. Senate for 24 years. In 1998, I returned to space. I joined a team of six other astronauts on Space Shuttle Discovery. My mission was to learn more about space travel. I became the oldest person to travel into space. I was 77 years old. Sadly, I died on, on December 6, 2016. I'm remembered today as an American hero. A lot of people think my machines are the best, while some people think others are better. Either way, I invented a plow that changed farming forever. I am John Deere. I was born on February 7, 1804 in Rutland, Vermont. When I was four years old, my father died. After that, my mother was helping the family. Since my mother was only helping the family, I wanted to help too. I got a job helping a tanner after school. Then when I was 17 years old, I became an apprentice. I started learning how to become a blacksmith. I made and repaired metal tools and small machines. In return for my work, I got a bed, some food, clothes, and a small salary. For a couple of years, I worked for other blacksmiths. Then eventually, I bought land and built my own shop. In 1827, I married Demarius Lamb. My shop burned down twice in not a very long time. I did not want to keep building my shop, so I had to find a new job. My new job was fixing stagecoaches and wagons. In 1833, I moved with my family to Hancock, Vermont. The hard, thick dirt made farming hard. Not many people wanted to buy my tools, so I moved to Grand Detour, Illinois, where the dirt was good for farming. I thought more people would buy my tools there. In Grand Detour, I built another shop. One of my first jobs there was fixing a broken saw for someone named Leonard Andrus. The dirt in Grand Detour was good, but it was hard to cut through the big roots of grass. I thought and thought until I got the idea to make a steel plow. First, I cut the teeth off a broken steel saw blade. Then I heated the steel and bent it to make it curve. After that, I put it on a wooden frame and added handles. When I tried it, it cut through the dirt easily. It also slid off the blade perfectly. I started making and selling steel plows. Demarius and the five children stayed in Vermont until Charles was born. Then in 1838, they came to Grand Detour with me. They stayed in the house I built for them. In 1842, I started a big company that made steel plows. I sold about 100 plows that year. One, then one year later, I became business partners with Leonard Andrus. In 1848, Leonard left to start his own company, and I decided to move to Moline, Illinois, next to Mississippi River. Moline was the perfect place for a factory. There, I made two friends to help me build a big factory. My company was soon selling hundreds of plows every year. Then in 1853, Charles joined the company. He was a good salesman, so I put him in charge of the factory. I then had time to become a farmer and think of ideas for new machines. Then in 1865, Demarius died. I was lonely, so I decided to go back to Vermont to visit my family. When I was in Vermont, I had some time with Luciana, Demarius' sister. We married in 1886. And in 1873, I became the mayor of Moline. I helped by donating money to schools and churches. Sadly, I died at the age of 82 in 1886. The first plow I made is on display at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC. There was also a great statue of me in Grand Detour. Today, my factories are in many different countries, and my machines are all around the world. Many people believe that I am one of the most peaceful civil rights leaders of all time. I spent my life working for equality for all, especially women. I am Coretta Scott King. I was born on April 27, 1927 in Highburg, Alabama. I grew up in the Great Depression. The South was still segregated and my family was poor. I helped my family by picking cotton and cleaning houses. I graduated first in a class from Lincoln High School in 1945. Then I studied music at Antioch College, Yellow Springs, Ohio, and New England Conservatory of Music in Boston, Massachusetts. I loved to sing and play the violin. While in Boston, I met Martin Luther King Jr. We shared many goals, like helping African Americans get good jobs. We got married on June 18, 1953. 350 guests came to the wedding. 
1954, we moved to Montgomery, Alabama. We had four children. Yolanda was born in 1955, then Martin III in 1957. We moved to Atlanta in 1960. Dexter was born in 1961 and Bernice in 1963. Martin wanted me to stay home, but together we traveled the world to Mexico and India to learn about the great Mahatma Gandhi. These trips had a big impact on me. Then we went to see the great South African leader, Nelson Mandela. After we returned, we heard on the news about a black woman named Rosa Parks. She was being told to give up her bus seat to a white man. Rosa refused. That was against the law. She was arrested and taken in jail. After Rosa was arrested, Martin suggested a bus boycott. His boycott lasted a year. In 1956, the Supreme Court stopped the unfair rules. Some people who were against civil rights for African Americans threatened us with violence. Sadly, Martin was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. This position me to take over. In honor of him, the day before his funeral, I led a march in his place. I believed that the world needed a change, so I changed it. I published a book in 1969 called My Life with Martin Luther King Jr. In January 1986, I accomplished one of my many goals, to make Martin's birthday a national holiday. Sadly, I died in 2006. About 10,000 people attended my funeral. I believe that the world needed a change. So together, Martin and I changed it. Well, unfortunately, due to COVID, we can't have them all come out onto the stage here and give them a huge applause, but they are up in the up in the balcony. So maybe you can just kind of turn around and let's give them a big round of applause for such a terrific show. And a, a big thank you to Mrs. Worsler. Who, who has worked tirelessly to, to prepare the students and inspire them and give them ideas and, and have them do all the research. So just a terrific show. And I, I mentioned a couple uh, to a couple of you earlier, it was just about a year ago, almost to the day that um, second grade was in here, for those of you that were here in second grade, and it was the, the state float project. And we it was the last event that the lower school had before we went into the spring lockdown. And we were sitting here like, wow, there's an awful lot of families in the, in the, in the audience. And, and the only precaution we took was we said, instead of walking around to all the different classrooms to see each of the, the, the state floats, let's just stay in your child's home. So it's wonderful that you're also the first families back to experience and enjoy our first performance in, back at school. And so we are really thankful and also for all the support that you've provided over the year. It's been a, a challenging year, but it's also been a, a year of great growth for our students and opportunities. And so thank you so much. Yesterday, um, we had our first uh, Mrs. Sinclair's class came and, and did their, their uh, presentations. And this morning in Carline, uh, a mom came by and rolled down her window and said, that was the best day of the year yesterday, Mr. Hansen. And we really miss having all of you come in, enjoy lunch, with your child on their birthday and be part of the classroom and, and so much more. But we're really thankful that we could offer this today. And thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, the, the students will be um, coming downstairs now and getting ready. But let's turn around one more time and give them one big round of applause. Thank you so much. And one, one final thank you to our COVID-19 response team, which is, which is Eric Hunker and Becky Hoagland and Janet Fireman, who, who in third grade said, you know what, we really wanna see if we can have the, the wax museum, the, it, it, we can have it on campus. And, and every time we started looking at it, they were saying, yep, we can do that. We can absolutely do that. And so thank you for allowing it and, and for, for providing uh, all of the, the safety precautions we've taken. So have a great afternoon, everybody.